Have you ever thought about how much noise is part of music making? And what even is noise as opposed to music? Is this noise? Or is it music? Is this music? Or is it noise? Turn it down in there. And what about this? That was Japanese noise artist Merzbau, who, if nothing else, reminds us that our attitudes to noise are socially constructed. What's noise today might be music tomorrow. OK, so I think there are several ways you can define noise, and one of them is in terms of pitch. The less pitch there is, or the more unclear the fundamental note is, the more likely it is to be considered noise. Here's a spectrogram of the note C played on a piano. You can see the fundamental tone and all the harmonics of the note above it. But here, by comparison, is the spectrogram of a snare drum, where there's pretty much an equal spread of sound across all the frequencies, so no specific pitch is perceived. The noise produced by the wire on the snare drum is called white noise. It's random and unstable, and you can find it being produced by all kinds of percussion instruments, from the cajon, the shaker, to the cymbal. Now, people often pinpoint the start of noise in music to Luigi Rossolo, an Italian composer and part of a group called the Futurists, who published a manifesto in 1913 called The Art of Noises. But the fact is, noise, from percussion instruments in particular, has always been part of music. Generally speaking, the more you want your music to sound aggressive or impressive, the more noise you should add. This was the approach taken by the Turkish military corps known as the Janissaries from the 14th century onwards. They wanted to intimidate other armies with a noisy barrage of sound, so their marching bands had a high proportion of drums, cymbals and gongs, along with trumpets and the loud, distorted tones of the shawm. It's thanks to these Janissary bands that we have many of these instruments in the modern orchestra. In the 17th and 18th century, European courts became fascinated with the barbarous, noisy sounds of these Turkish bands. And pretty soon, composers like Haydn and Mozart were writing parts for Turkish cymbals, triangles and bass drums in their operas and symphonies. Haydn even included a Turkish crescent in his military symphony, which is a forerunner of this thing. But that's a subject for another video. Another way you can make a noisy, unpitched effect is a tone cluster, which is a way of playing a cluster of notes close together that produce a sound that has no clear tonal centre. Again, this kind of sound is used to make a scary or impressive effect. The Ashanti people in Ghana use tone clusters in traditional trumpet music to dispel evil spirits. And in classical music, you can find tone clusters surprisingly early. The first examples of this were literally effects meant to convey the sounds of cannon fire, written into battle pieces like Jean-Francois Dandre's Les Caractères de la Guerre from 1724. But it's fascinating to see that even in the 18th century, they were being used as an integral part of the music as well. Here are two examples by Domenico Scarlatti. Although these pieces do just about make sense in terms of functional harmony, you can see that what Scarlatti is really doing is exploring the very edges of what he would have considered noise. He's daring himself further along that spectrum towards what might be considered socially unacceptable. And that brings us to another definition of noise, and that's simply the culturally accepted meaning of what noise is and what music is. For a long time that definition had remained fairly stable, but in the early years of the 20th century things started to change. And this is where those futurists like Luigi Rossolo come back into the picture. Rossolo felt that the sounds of modern machinery, pistons, levers, hammers, whistles, things that had hitherto been thought of as noise, deserved a place in the world of music. And he started creating his own noise-generating instruments he called intonora mori. At the same time, Eric Satie was composing his ballet Parade, which included everyday noise-generating objects like a siren, a steam engine and typewriters. There must have been something in the air around this time, towards the end of World War I, 
as this was a comparable move to what Marcel Duchamp was doing in the art world. Duchamp took objects from the real world, most famously a urinal, and signed them and placed them in an art gallery and called them art, sparking angry debates that have gone on to this day about bricks, unmade beds, and so on. The socially accepted definition of noise took another battering with the advent of electronic music, which made possible a whole range of new noises. In the 1940s, Peter Schaefer created a new technique he called music concrete, a way of taking existing recordings like the sound of a steam train and making new electronic instruments out of them. If that sounds a bit obscure, just think about how central a place this technique has in popular music today. Here's EDM producer Skrillex talking about how he manipulated Justin Bieber's voice on the track Where Are You Now? The most. So it's like pitched way up, distorted, bounced, rebounced again, so it sounds worse almost. You can really like almost destroy a sound so many times it, it loses quality, which is a, a cool thing I like. It's like people always trying to like avoid digital distortion, but we always like using it. So there's Skrillex literally adding more noise, distorting a recorded sample to create an effect, a new instrument. The fact that such noise effects can be used on a top selling record shows you that an acceptance of these sounds has moved on. And it's actually moved on quite a lot. The distortion of the electric guitar was probably one of the key elements that helped shift society's acceptance of noise further along the spectrum. Jimi Hendrix, of course, was a key figure here, often seeming to explore noise for its own sake, just as Scarlatti had done two centuries before. One album that became very influential was Lou Reed's Metal Machine Music of 1975, which is nothing but pure feedback and other guitar effects. No one's quite sure whether Reed meant it as a joke, but either way, the album went on to become hugely influential on groups like Sonic Youth and the whole genre that became known as noise rock. As these kinds of sounds became more accepted in society, it was inevitable that artists would continue to push further into regions formerly known as noise. And this is where we get back to Meersbau, who spearheaded a genre of music that became known as harsh noise wall, a style that has been described as a literal, consistent, unflinching and enveloping wall of noise. So is this really still music? Even if you think not, the fact that Merzbau does have a substantial following shows you that for some people at least it is, and it's truly a reminder that definitions of noise are relative. As Merzbau himself said, if by noise you mean uncomfortable sound, then pop music is noise to me. That by the way can count as another definition of noise, an unpleasant or uncomfortable sound. The final definition we're going to look at is the idea of noise as unwanted or unintended sound. As we saw earlier, someone could be playing Chopin in the next room, but if it's disturbing you, it's a form of noise. It might surprise you to think of John Cage's 4 minutes 33, the famous silent piece, as being about noise, but that's exactly what it was. Cage was attempting to show that any sounds, the cough of an audience member, the sound of traffic, are just as valid as the sounds that come from traditional instruments. And Cage spent much of his career finding inventive new ways to make music out of these unintended or unwanted sounds whether it's by using a dice to create music completely by chance, or by randomly tuning radios into different frequencies during the course of a piece. More recently, one of my favourite comedy composers of the contemporary classical music scene is Richard Ayres, who talks about his love of unwanted sounds, and fills his pieces not just with kitsch or cheap sounding music, but also the sounds of the soloist rummaging in a box for a lost mute or having to run unexpectedly to another music stand. Comedy is something that's never far away from any music that deals with noises. Many noises we do find funny or feeble or just weird. But just look at the range of emotions we've now covered, from aggression and power through to humour and patheticness. As good musicians, we should have the ability to conjure all these feelings as part of our arsenal. And that's why we should remind ourselves of the power of the art of noise. So have you considered the role of noise in your own music? How do you use it? Let me know in the comments. And if you like this video, please hit that like button and consider subscribing. See you next time.